imagine a world where you could click a button and get a car. I don't have to walk to get the car. I'm going to get to the destination. That car kind of magically disappears. And so in a world where ride hail prices are going up, that's the magic. The trade is it's considerably cheaper than ride hail. Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Justin Spratt is Vice President of Business and Corporate Development at Vey, the leading remote driving company. He joined from Uber, where he was head of global strategic partnerships and focus on deals with automotive OEMs, vehicle fleet operators, vehicle battery technology companies, and electrification infrastructure providers. At Vey, he focuses on business and corporate development and works on relationships with strategic partners. Justin also built the first startup incubator in Africa in 2002 and has been mentoring founders of technology startups for over 10 years. He's an angel investor in software technology and holds board positions in some of these companies also. And I just got the quick background. It sounds like you're living in Amsterdam from Germany. And then now, according to your bio, you're also in Africa at one point. So you really are a world traveler, huh, Justin? Yeah, that's right. And and originally Australian, so which which will account for the poor accent uh, <laughs> and the mispronunciation of some words. So my apologies cool. in advance. Well, I'm glad you told me that you're Australian because I have this, I'm very aggressive and I have a bad habit of guessing people's accents, but I'm really horrible at that game. So I would say probably about 90% of the time I, I say that people are British and when they turn out to be Australian. So usually only a few people get offended. Yeah. Aussies don't get offended too, too much. So we'll, we'll be okay. Awesome. Well, you know, I was really excited to have you on. Obviously, you know, you and I think I've maybe known each other virtually online and Twitter for quite a while from your time at Uber. And, you know, when I saw this, you know, a lot of folks from Uber have obviously gone on to what I call adjacent industries, right? Food delivery, ghost kitchens, scooters. I think you're the first person that kind of popped up in my mind that went into this teledriving space. And it seems like Vey is pretty big, pretty far along. So I would love to know, like, what's the high level pitch and what made you want to join this company and really this industry? Yeah, it's, it wasn't, an, it wasn't a, a slam dunk, but I have to say that uh, when I met the people, so I'll start off with your second question first. Uh, when I met all the talent, uh, the concentration of talent in Vey and the founders, mm -hmm. I saw like an amazing sense of smarts. Mm -hmm. I saw um, a, a huge degree of humility, which I loved. And then I took a, a ride in the car and I was like, wow, okay, there's something really special here. I got This is going to be the most interesting thing for me out of all of the options. And so, mm -hmm. so I went to Vey. So what is Vey? Vey, I mean, at, at its basic level, we remotely drive vehicles. Okay. And, you know, that spins off a bunch of interesting questions, which we can cover in this podcast. But really, imagine a world where you could click a button and get a car. I mean, mm. that's really the magic of it. And so you, you start thinking about a whole bunch of these applications, and especially from a consumer point of view, you know, for car share, I don't have to walk to get the car. For car rental, mm -hmm. I don't have to walk to get the car. And when I get to the destination, that car kind of magically disappears. Mm -hmm. And so the trade there for consumers as well. So that's the magic. The trade is it's considerably cheaper than ride hail. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a world where ride hail prices are, are going up and the bottom of the supply, the more, uh, the, the, yeah, the more price sensitive part of that uh, demand curve is dropping out at some points. Mm -hmm. We think there's a really good trade. Hey, if you're prepared to drive your own car, then, you know, maybe we give you a 20 to 40% discount. Yeah. And so for us, that feels compelling, you know, where the magic intersects with a, a price point that's interesting, mm -hmm. we think there's a, potentially a big market there. And then the adjacencies to that actually are kind of urban personal commute, you know, transit as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can bring a car to you for mar marginally more than what a city commute costs, like public transport, maybe you'll fall into the consideration set. Yeah. And so, and there's a whole bunch of different potential target markets that provide, you know, what I call these values of vector for customers. And so that's what we're aiming for and we're driving really hard to, towards. 
Very cool. So I will say when you said click a button and get a car, you know what that reminded me of? We sort of already have that with Uber. I guess the key distinction here is you get a car and then you drive the car, right? So I really like that idea because I feel like, you know, a lot of trips you would almost, you know, you don't mind driving yourself. You know, maybe I'm thinking like the Friday, Saturday night when you're going to the bar, even going to the bar, you know, you might want to drive. It's just the coming home that you don't want to drive. So what do you sort of feel like is the most compelling use case for the service? Yeah, look, we have a longer term vision, which we can chat to around mm -hmm. autonomy and ride hail. But right mm -hmm. now we think the the common use case will be urban commute. So, you know, going to the doctor, going to the shops, has picking up the kids, you know, we see this as, you know, and you'll know this too, Harry, like for the last 10 years, people have been pitching car as a service. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is you always needed, you know, outside of ride hail, it was actually inconvenient. Yeah. Now, if you can kind of click a button, get a car and you're prepared to make that trade on the price, all of a sudden car as a service becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. I can then click a button and get a car for the ride I need. Is mm -hmm. it a short commute to the shops? Bring me a short car. Is this thing a multi-day commute? Then perhaps I need a station wagon for my kids. So that's the evolution. But at the start, it'll be having a fleet of cars in urban areas doing urban commutes. So like short distance trips around the city. And yeah, we, we think that's potentially super interesting. And then obviously various cities will have different kinds of use cases that are predominant. Yeah. And the ideal customer, is this someone who doesn't own a car? Yeah, I think, look, we think that the world, especially the younger demographics, we think that, that people will generally have less cars. I mean, it's playing out, certainly in mm -hmm. California. Younger yeah. people have their car ownership dispensation is going down. So clearly that is a target demographic. We also think it might take, re replace rides of people who even own cars because of the specificity of the vehicle we can bring. So mm -hmm. if you own a big luxury car and you need to shoot to the shops, it could be that it's cheaper and easier, actually cheaper to take a, a VA drive car vehicle mm -hmm. because the price point is so interesting, right? And then you don't have to park the car. I mean, there's a large benefit in not having to park or pay for parking. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of dynamics here that seem like minor but i mean in an urban up, dense downtown not having to pay is probably cheaper than the cost of the ride to be frank right i mean it's usually 10 yeah. 20 30 40 if you go overnight you know it's 50 to 100 dollars exactly. and you know any major city in the u.s at least to park a car overnight these days right yeah exactly and so yeah and and, and there's a whole bunch of ancillary benefits around there you mm -hmm. know we can talk kind of the economic footprint we can talk about the environmental footprint yeah. all of that kind of stuff but essentially the, the trajectory there is more efficient car usage mm -hmm. use the car uh, for the use case in question and then price it accordingly and then yeah on average you'll see there's a ton of economic benefit yeah for for everyone frankly yeah, no, I definitely see a lot of cool direct and even longer tail use cases. It seems to me, you know, kind of similar to, you know, where Uber and Ridehill have the most demand, as you would know, you know, more dense urban downtowns. I mean, there's a reason why New York City is the biggest transportation market in the world with 113,000 Uber and Lyft vehicles on the streets, right? <laughs> Every single day, basically. So it seems like, and, you know, I guess like adding on to that, I don't know that you necessarily have to not own a car or not, but, you know, if you don't own a car, yeah. that would make this product more compelling, but it would probably make, you know, these suite of options more compelling too. And, you know, even when I first gave my, you know, first Uber rides in Los Angeles, eight, nine years ago, I was picking up passengers who, you know, were ditching their car. So I feel like there's always been this myth of like, Hey, you know, Uber is going to get people out of their cars and not buying cars. And you are right. You know, like the 16 year olds these days, not all of them are getting their license. So I feel like that's a slow moving trend. Do you think that's a big factor though, in your product? Or do you think like the market as it is today, like your product can, and your service pay can really succeed and crush it in today's market? Or do you see this as more of like in five, 10 years will absolutely dominate? I think that our product can crush it today. And, mm -hmm. and that's because of the economics, which we can talk to a little bit. But sure. I mean, all you have to do is take a step back and imagine this vehicle market uh, or the market for passenger cars. And, and imagine, you know, what about a world where if I could choose the car for the for the drive that I need. If I could choose mm -hmm. that instantaneously and it would come to me, surely that's a world that's good. 
And let's park, let's frame that with some stats, right? 95% mm -hmm. of the time a car's sitting idle, it's a depreciating right. asset, interest rates are going up. You know, we're seeing a big shape change in the demand curve on vehicles, you know, from ICE to EVs. Yep. And that EV technology is changing at a rapid clip. So do I really want to own a car? Yeah. Well, it's clearly not a rational decision, but but maybe the emotive stuff is coming out of it over yeah. time, especially in the younger generations. But imagine if I could pay a month, monthly fee and I actually get a car as a service, you yeah. know, and this is what we talked about at Uber from ride hail, but then, you know, cushion that with all of the other types of vehicles. And it all starts with the car, right? And so ride, ha ride hail is an incredibly good option for mm -hmm. so many use cases. And so, you know, I get that, that but at some price point, you know, with, supplies and come back as strong and matching yeah. the growth of ride hail. And so, you know, surge and, and some of the prices have gone up. It's allowed yeah. Uber to be profitable. This is all good stuff. But the bottom end of that demand curve has dropped out. So how do we service them? How do we get some people where an urban commute on public transport is difficult? How do we give them a better experience? And so, you know, if you put all of this together, it's kind of interesting. If I could have a monthly fee or subscription. Yeah to an automaker for instance mm -hmm. and then maybe a supplemental fee for every ride i take yeah. and these cars are new and they're always serviced and they're always charged and they're always clean yeah that's incredibly compelling for probably 80 percent of the population so my view is that over the next decade we're going to see that come to fruition and we're going to see a huge impact as far as the efficiencies of motor vehicles go and yeah. look, when we touch the OEMs, they see this potential too. The only challenge for them is they need to, t you know, take five-year planning cycles where they get the cash up front yeah. and shift that to, you know, a cash flow model. And that's super difficult for a multi-billion dollar company. And so that takes time. Yeah, uh, we'll definitely talk about some of the partnerships and, uh, you know, quasi competitors. I don't know, uh, maybe you sort of reminded me about OEMs. I'm a bit skeptical as, uh, you know, basically every foray they've had into new mobility hasn't worked out so well. <laughs> but, you know, before let's, I, you know, you mentioned economics and the price coming down. Before we touch on that, though, can you give a little background? Where are you guys operating? What's the fleet size? You know, how many rides you're doing? Whatever your kind of context and background you can share. So we have a, a scale of what, what the business looks like today. Yeah. So look, we are building out our business still. Mm -hmm. We have operations in Hamburg, Berlin, and importantly for this conversation in Las Vegas. And Las oh, Vegas cool. is where our commercial permit resides for now. And I can get into the regulatory stuff. It's a little bit boring for people, but happy to talk about that. Suffice to say that Las Vegas is our launch market and we're going to launch very soon. And I expect, you oh, know, cool. from my perspective, I, I expect us to have you know, a, a few hundred vehicles over the next 12 to 18 months. But look, I think what we need to do is validate our hypotheses first. Mm -hmm. We're very excited about doing that. And that's all around product market fit. So yeah. is what I'm saying validated by actually people buying it? And look, a ton of our research, we've had closed beta service yeah. in Germany. There's a ton of data to suggest this is incredibly exciting. And, you know, the technology works. It's about seeing how this spins out at scale and what kind of economics it flushes out yeah. of the system and where that's going to go to. So I feel like we feel incredibly confident about the technology. Mm -hmm. Now we need to go validate that in the market. And Las Vegas is our first point of departure there. Oh, interesting. And so I guess just to be clear, when you say operating, you mean the team is kind of based in Germany, you've done some closed betas here, but it sounds like the actual product you're going to be launching in America, Las Vegas. Yeah, so so this is kind of interesting. So we have R and D in Berlin, and we have an oper an operation testing our vehicles without anyone inside the car. Mm -hmm. This is important. This is like this is an incredibly powerful event that's happened. Yeah. So let me unpack this a little bit. So from a regulatory point of view in Europe, which is and it's certainly Germany is arguably the highest automotive safety standard in the world. Yeah. We have been given permits to take everyone out of the car and mm -hmm. test okay we on are on city streets to, on sorry on public roads yeah oh, wow. and we were told that we would never get this yeah uh, and to do that in germany you, you need an automotive grade system so you'll see that you know we have some competitors who we regard highly but the difference between us is we've developed an automotive grade platform which basically means you can pick pick it up, put it in a car and use it at scale on public streets, assuming you have the right safety validation and permits. 
Mm-hmm. This is incredibly difficult to do, and no one else has done this. So that's kind of interesting, but it means so that the Germany product really- it can be basically added on to any existing vehicle. It will get there. Yeah, it's in theory. Yes, we need to Got bring it. up different electronic architecture each vehicle, and we would sure. need to bring each one of those. Okay, up. But I mean, I guess that's the sort of idea that you guys are working it's- towards versus you know taking a specific fleet of cars, and it's like, hey, you're only yeah. going to have one to three options. You guys at least have the you know you may not do it at the start, but you at least have the potential to add on you know almost multiple or different makes. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the headline for this particular piece of information is that. Our safety standard mm-hmm. is, you know, in my view, an order of magnitude better than p- potentially in other places, you know, and this has cost us money and time. And we think this is going to be a competitive advantage, you know, going forward. The safety piece is critical, just like you see in autonomy, which we yeah. can talk about. But well, I mean, it seems the- like a pretty big accomplishment if you've gotten approval in Germany, in Europe. I mean, obviously, Europe is, as you know, is sort of well known for more strict regulations when it comes to labor and technology and all that. So without yeah. being an expert in that side of things, it seems like a good accomplishment if you have vehicles driving around the roads that are being teleoperated right now in Germany. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Germany, we, we had to have, yeah, we went through mm-hmm. several regulatory bodies to get this single permit. And so it was a massive achievement, incredible. So so the but the German and the European regulatory path moves a little bit slower. It's a very mm-hmm. different kind of setup, you know, a, a high bar to get a permit. In the US, it's slightly different. There's a lot of, it's a lower bar, but there's a lot more self-policing and mm-hmm. ensuring you have all your own house in order. And obviously, because it's potentially more litigious there, you need to make sure you do everything properly. And yeah. so, but just different ways of doing it. It means that the US regulatory path is simpler in some states and hence mm-hmm. why we've gone to Las Vegas. And actually, you know, it's been fantastic going and we've had a really good welcome and there's been a f- fantastic feedback from people. So Very we're excited cool. to be there. But, but those are the two differences. We are continuing our regu- regulatory path in, in Europe, mm-hmm. starting with Germany on our commercial uh, permit. So that's imminent. And yeah. then in the US, we have our commercial permit. And so we're going to be going ahead and launching there very soon. So let's talk about this upcoming Vegas launch. And I won't hold you to a timeline, but it sounds like the model is going to be some sort of subscription for customers. Can you talk a little bit about what you think it might cost? And you know, we can get into the economics. Yeah. So I've been told to be not too precise on this because there's a lot of moving, as you can imagine. But let me give you what I can. And so, yeah, well, if you don't have um, the specifics, I mean, I think there's also kind of the more broad, you know, is it worth it, you know, with this technology kind of discussion we can have? Yeah. So, look, we raised $110 million for this mm-hmm. venture in large part because the economic potential is so big, right? Got it. There's no way you raise that kind of money unless there's a huge total addressable. And so Mm -hmm. we went through, you know, our series B was a huge amount of market analysis and spending out, making sure there was this kind of enough margin for us to make money, especially, you know, positioned against right hail. So let's talk a little little bit about that. Depending on where we are and what city, and you'll know that cities vary from a pricing point of view with Mm -hmm. Uber, uh, from an Uber perspective, it's similar to us, right? The thing, so, so it, it'll depend, but the range that we are pricing ourselves at is, is between 20 and 40% cheaper than ride hail. Got it. That's Got our it. zone of pricing. And so every city that we launch, we will ensure that we have an ability to do that mm-hmm. because clearly, you know, the trade is we're going to give you a lower price, but you have to drive yourself. And right. so it's this demographic, this target demographic between ride hail, that price sensitive piece I mentioned and public transport. And in there, there's something really interesting as our thesis. So how do we get there? I mean, the way we're able to do that, because we still got humans in the loop, and we can talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that as well. But we can do that because we, you know, in effect, teleport our drivers into the car when there is an economic transaction. So yeah. you will know this too. There's, there's this thing called empty miles at Uber. Mm-hmm. And these empty miles tend to stack up quite a bit, whether you're yeah. driving around or, or sitting still waiting for a ride. And so we are able to limit that substantially by having vehicles positioned in a city or in an urban area. And that's also based on a demand graph and like little mini uh, hotspots or ODDs, Mm -hmm. operational design domains. 
for this depending on demand. But essentially, we have our cars spread out across the urban area. And then when there's an economic transaction, we essentially teleport our driver into that vehicle. The vehicle gets picked up, taken to the customer and handed across through voice activation, through voice two, by the way. Mm-hmm. So our tele driver will sit there and go, hey, welcome to this experience. I'm going to hand you the car now. And then you take over the car, you drive yourself. And when you get to the end destination, you essentially end the ride. And then the, the tele driver comes back in as you're ending that ride and takes the car away. And so you start to compress those empty miles and that spins out a ton of economics mm-hmm. on this particular piece. Well, when you say compress empty miles, I mean, so when we think about in the context of an Uber driver, yep. I would say we'll call this period one, which is the insurance terminology they would use. It's when you have your app on and you're waiting for a request, right? So you could be parked on the side of the street. You could be driving around because there's nowhere to park, right? And then period two, you accept a ride. You're now driving to the passenger, right? So your teledriver is essentially in control during period one. If there's nowhere to park, they have to kind of drive the vehicle around yep. or find a parking spot. And then period two, the teledriver driver has to be there, right? Because they're now driving to the customer. And then period three is kind of really, you got the passenger or customer in the car, but now the big difference is they're driving themselves, right? So you're kind of eliminating that I mean, I guess you're really mainly eliminating that P3, right? Which as a driver, as an Uber driver, human driver, I'm trying to maximize that time because that's when I make the most amount of money. So it's sort of interesting, right? Because you kind of, you know, you guys are sort of similar, right? Like you want to maximize that time too, because- that's when the human driver will yeah be in there. exactly yeah a hundred percent but remember when we're not driving or mm-hmm. waiting for a ride uh, the tele driver is not sitting there and waiting for a ride the tele driver at scale is doing another ride Got yeah it. and at scale you'll be able to shift. but that does depend so on driver. them having somewhere to park right yes yeah, so what we what we do when we go into cities similar to car share companies is we mm-hmm. get an urban permit to park anywhere and then we also have, we also actually map out the, the parking lots as well. Yeah. And so we will have a, a way to most efficiently go and park that car. And yeah. there'll be some algorithm. Well, there is an algorithm that needs to find flight in, in the market, but that determines what is the hot zone for that car to be in. And if, yeah. if that car goes out on an economic transaction, we'll bring another one in. Mm-hmm. And then what is the most efficient way to park that car? Got and it. so the compression on those empty miles also happens in phase one and two, right? Because mm-hmm. one, especially you actually, in theory, economically active elsewhere. And then two, when you're driving to that destination, yeah, at scale, that will be a lot shorter too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because we kind of map the demand accordingly. Yeah. We make sure our I mean, that's sort in- of similar to, you know, Uber, as you know, right? Obviously, they're really targeting that three to five minute ETA because at scale, they can kind of have a driver, you know, nearby. They can sort of efficiently match and switch people, you know, if, oh, a driver ended early and, you know, kind of put them back online. You know the destination. You can set up the next trip. So, yeah, I think there's definitely yeah. some cool synergies right. there. What's that, Justin? So, so at scale, yes. Yeah, so at scale in a big city, that works. Mm-hmm. But the reality is in, in more spread out urban cities, so yeah. outside of the big, big cities where ride hail just makes a ton of sense, the ETA is a, you know, it's that kind of ride hail time trap, right? Yeah. It says five minutes, it's 10 minutes. So, so you know, there, there is some fat in that as well, we think. Um, yeah. So they're probably, I think, well, I think what you're kind of getting at is the fact that, you know, when you own the fleet, you can kind of effectively more reposition, right? If I'm an Uber driver, you can't tell me go somewhere, you know, another part of town, right? You can sort of encourage me, right? They do that using heat maps and, you know, flat surge, you know, get into this zone and we'll guarantee a a $2 bonus on your next trip, right? But I think when you are the owner of the fleet, it's sort of more responsibility, but also more control. So I think there is a benefit there. So I feel like everything you've, I think the pitch is very compelling, you know? Like, I think maybe if I'm out or not, maybe, but the only kind of situation is like Friday, Saturday night, I don't want to drive home after I've been drinking, but every other use case, it's like, Hey, if I can get a a car to myself and it's cheaper, I feel like that'll be pretty compelling for a lot of people. I think the big question mark to me that I'd love to understand from you is like, what is the technology, the trade-off right versus you know all this additional technology the product i guess also kind of a teleoperator driver i don't know where they're going to be based if they're going to be us or you know remote globally you know to save on cost yep. there versus you know you know like where does that 20 40 percent come from basically yeah exactly i think these are great questions just to talk about your going out and coming back 
slightly inebriated use case, you know, part of our product vision is a tele chauffeur service. Mm -hmm. So there, and that's for personal cars as well. I mean, yeah. you know, that's further out. Well, I was um, thinking, and, I was like, you know, why can't you just have the teledriver drive you home too while you're at it, <laughs> right? I mean, that might be a nice upgrade. I'll take a ride and I could drive myself or I could just have someone drive me. So we can do that, but that's a permitting thing. And so uh, mm. we will need to build the safety case, uh, you know, over multiple use cases and get the, the regulators comfortable with what we're trying to do. Uh, and rightly so. So th that's on the roadmap. There's this tele chauffeur service we have planned. Mm -hmm. We chat to OEMs about and then there's also, you know, Vay Ride, where we could theoretically do ride hail at yep. some point in the future. So back to the technology. So look, the technology, I think let's start off at a price point here. And I'll give you ranges, even yep. though I've been told not to. The sensor sets that are going on autonomous cars, you know, we spoke to a guy that was working in an autonomous company up until a couple of months ago. And to try and crack this last percent or last tenth of the percent that breaks yeah. the use case, yeah. that sensor set technology is actually going up in cost. So it's not coming down yet. Yeah. The business case is moving away. And he said yeah. to us, look, that that can cost up to a Lamborghini. Now, yeah. you know, whatever that Lamborghini costs is at $100,000, $300,000. You, yeah. you do the math. But we know it's getting more expensive. So we've taken a different approach. We've said, okay, we're going to keep the human in the loop for as much as possible. For, what, for as much as makes sense, because guess what? Humans are actually very good sensing and perception engines. Yeah. I'm going to take a cost plus approach on this stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have a camera based technology, five cameras on the car and audio. We have a, a routing stack on that, which uses mobile network providers, obviously from a latency and also a fail safe point of view. Mm -hmm. We have a whole bunch of ISO cybersecurity protocols wrapped around that transmission. And then we go in through to the teledrive and we have a teledrive, a tele station, which has got a whole software stack, which obviously unpacks the compression of the video and the audio. It's got a bunch of augmented safety features. It will soon have driver tracking and there's a whole bunch of safety protocols baked in there. Mm -hmm. And then around all of that, we have these things which in engineering circles are well known, but stranger to, to others is this safety concept. So how do we respond based on certain events. Mm -hmm. So the easiest one to think of is latency. So as the latency gets too big and you don't have as good a contact with that vehicle, what does your vehicle do and what does your technology do? That's a large part of our IP, but mm -hmm. that's also a large part of what differentiates us. And what we've been able to do is, you know, create some magic around, you know, controlling the vehicle through what's called the drive-by-wire harness. So, yeah. so getting our technology to talk to that vehicle in a digital way and then transmitting it to our tele station, unpacking that and making sure that the tele driving experience, which we can talk about, is as safe as possible. And so there's always trade-offs, but you know, our view on this is that there is a slight latency in milliseconds between mm -hmm. driver and car, but we have 360 degree vision. There's a lot of safety software features in our technology there's a lot of tracking for the driver there's a lot yeah. of predictive yeah. kind of driving mechanisms in our tele station so there's a ton of stuff there and all of that is to say that you know our modeling you know according to the modeling that i do in, 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 from my point of view at scale if, if we get to scale on this thing our technology should be under ten thousand mm. dollars yeah in wow. fact i think it's a lot less but I feel fairly comfortable with that $10,000 mark. So if you look at $10,000 versus, you know, potentially Lamborghini cost sensor yeah. sets. I mean, I feel like with LiDAR, alone, you know, I've heard, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars And that's always been my big question with autonomous. It's like, hey, you're replacing drivers that are making 15 to 20 bucks an hour after expenses. And you're adding on $300,000 of hardware. Like, first of all, like, what's the break even point? And then that's just from a technology yeah. point of view. You know, there's the business model. There's all these, you know, someone pukes in the car, the fleet operation. There's all these additional aspects. So I guess to me, you know, with exactly. autonomous, that's my biggest cost. And it sounds like you guys are going for a price point that is, you know, a fraction of what LIDAR, you know, kind of Waymo system will cost. Right. So a couple of things there. So firstly, it's the worst kept secret that autonomous doesn't have a business case yet. Right. <laughs> and we're huge fans of autonomous, by the way. Yeah. We, we know it's going to work eventually. We personally think humans are, are going to be in that process for, you know, a very, very long time. Yeah. You know, the other uh, badly 
kept secret is there's a lot of humans that are in all the autonomy stack as well, right? Naturally so, you know, through tele operations and waypoint wayfinding for, for vehicles when they get stuck. So 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 in many ways, the tele driving and tele operating world is already part of autonomy. The challenge is the business case, and it will get there, right? And you need to make these big investments to, to kind of break through. So we get all that. And luckily, if you've got the right balance sheet behind you, you can break through and get it right eventually. Yeah. From our perspective and what we pitched, which interestingly came from our CEO and founder, Thomas, he was a, a TPM, technical program manager at Zooks, mm. the autonomous mm. company that's bought by Amazon. And he was, this was about four years ago, four and a half years ago. Yeah. And he realized, wow, you know, humans are going to be in this mix for a hell of a long time. Yeah. So, so what is the on-ramp to autonomy? And so he said, well, that's going to be tele-driving. So let's go and raise money and build a tele-driving stack because humans are good at sensing and perception. We'll keep them in the yeah. loop. And then as yeah. this autonomy sorts itself out, becomes robust and economical, then we'll add it to our stack. And so yeah. that's our plan. We have an autonomy strategy where we will start. And it turns out that autonomy, you know, between two thirds and three quarters is actually quite easy yeah. and affordable. Right. And so if you put that in with a human, you start to see even further enhancements on the economics. And yeah. for us, that's super interesting. Well, and I feel like a lot of the edge cases in autonomy can actually be solved pretty easily by a teleoperated, not easily, but can be solved by a teleoperated. You know, there is a picture the other day of a cruise vehicle driving into cement in San Francisco, right? I mean, if you're sitting there watching, you're like, hey, construction zone, you know, let me teleoperate around this construction zone. It's actually pretty easy to do. But I bet, you know, figuring that out on the autonomous side is probably like, you know, a six month problem with a hundred engineers. And then obviously well, anyone who's driven a new car car lately too. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, five years ago, you could get into a, a new Subaru and it had lane keep, you know, to keep you in the lane and adaptive cruise control. And so, I mean, almost every new car, if you pay for it now has these suite of features that are sort of, you know, kind of like obviously help in the tele driving, right? Like it's not like the tele operator, you know, some, I don't know, we don't have to get into all the technology, but I feel like yeah. these sort of tailwinds are kind of helping you guys there with, you know, the, the actual technology that's built in these cars already, Plus, you know, the kind of benefit of having that teleoperated driver. Well, exactly. So, you know, I mean, yeah, without getting too technical, Mercedes, like a lot of the OEMs, Mercedes has got this L3 technology that you can pay for, and it's actually permitted on highways in the US. Um, and this is essentially like what I call, and I'm not an automotive engineer, but ADAS plus, like these advanced driving features plus, you're still behind your wheel, you still yeah. need to be able to take the wheel. But there's a bunch of that technology which can actually drive the yeah. car for I mean, big chunks of the journey. That, that's a good point. You know, I think all the top OEMs and, you know, Tesla would be the, the best example with their, you know, sort of autopilot feature. I mean, I would never go on the freeway and fall asleep, but I would feel very confident if there was a teledriver and all the Tesla was doing was just going 80 miles an hour. Let's, oh, sorry, let's say 70, <laughs> even though everyone goes 80 in LA, right? It's going 70 miles an hour down the 405 and there's a medium, you know, a normal traffic day, like not crazy traffic or anything. And there's a tele, like, you know, for one, no merging, nothing for like an hour. I, I think that would yeah. be pretty compelling. Like I would feel confident, you know, in that kind of setup, as long as there's no construction or, you know, anything like that. Yeah, exactly. And so like you, you see, and I mean, if we look at autonomy mm. and, you know, robotics, I mean, we think the future, if you look at, it's not just autonomy, mm. right? It's not just, the, sorry, it's not just vehicles, but if you look at this, it's going to be a mix of robots and humans for yeah. the foreseeable future. Definitely. Uh, and, and vehicle transport is no different, right? This humans are very good sensing yeah. and perception engine. We just need to balance it with some economies and, and maybe taking out the boring stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's no, how you. And I, I think we're on the same. I think in the last chapter of my book, I've had it out, you know, I wrote about five, six years ago and it was basically answer, you know, that was when self-driving cars were big the first time. And that's exactly what I said is that, you know, there's going to be this hybrid situation for a very long time yeah. if you really understand the dynamics and look at it. So we've talked a, a lot about the awesomeness and the positives. What could go wrong here? What like keeps you up at night? What worries you? And if I've got a couple ideas in my mind, but if, if you don't want to answer the question, I can rattle off a few, but I would love to know like, what, you you know, obviously this is a new technology and you guys are accounting for a lot of these situations, but like, what do you think is the biggest challenge here or something that can go wrong? And obviously, how are you thinking about it? 
Yeah, so look, I mean, the obvious thing is the speed limit. We limit ourselves to 50 kilometers an hour. In fact, we kind of, you know, throttle ourselves down to 40 kilometers an hour, depending on the road conditions. Mm. Sometimes being too slow is obviously unsafe, but we try and keep yeah. that at a minimum speed distance. So uh, more city as far driving. As the safety. Yeah, exactly. And so it's urban commute, it's lower speeds. Okay. You know, I, and so in, when you're driving cars, that's always the difficulty. Like what happens if this large bit of metal does something you don't want it to, right? So yeah. but, but that's the first thing we control the speed. The second thing is probably, you know, people talk about is another obvious one is like latency or what happens if you lose connection with the vehicle? Yeah, I think that um, was sort of what came to mind. You mentioned mobile network yeah. and I'm like, oh God, my 4G around LA, there's so many, a lot of yeah. issues. I've got AT&T. Yeah. So yeah, tell me what so, happens first, if connection drops, what does the car do? Yeah. And then second, how do you prevent it from happening in the first place? Yeah, I mean, this is part of the business I'm really excited about. Maybe it's because I used to work for a telco back in many moons ago, but so there's a few things going on here. First of all, we have four routers in the car. So theoretically, if there's four mobile networks, we'll put four mobile networks there. Got it. Right. So it would take four, four mobile networks to go down simultaneously for us to lose contact with that car. Got it. In so four that and might half be AT and T, Verizon, T Mobile, and some other one I've never heard of. Yeah, there was this other one that Amazon did a deal with, right? This MBNO. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you mm -hmm. add the so, what's Elon's new one? Starlink. Starlink. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of interesting. We, you know, some of our engineers have tested Starlink, but that's for another podcast. So, so you got four mobile so, networks. So four, yeah, so four mobile networks would have to go down simultaneously, mm -hmm. and in four and a half years of t testing, you know, we haven't lost contact with a car. So wow. we've got a lot of technology in this particular space. We feel very good about it. We have some patents in it as well. But to give you one example, so so one example of why I'm excited about it, and then one, you know, what happens if we do lose contact with a car. The one example, you know, we went to Mobile World Congress in partnership with Deutsche Telekom and Ericsson, mm -hmm. and we basically drove, Tilly drove a car with a 9,000 kilometer distance between it, between the car and the Tilly station. What does that mean? We had our Tilly station in Barcelona mm -hmm. and our car was in Berlin. And that the routing of that was 9,000 kilometers. We Got did it. that Tilly driving yeah. as a demonstration on one SIM mm -hmm. and didn't lose contact with the car. Now, what were we, why did we do that? We were testing a technology called L4S. It gets a bit nerdy here, but essentially mm -hmm. what it means in layman's terms, there is a technology that's being rolled out by the network providers that allows you to prioritize safety critical traffic. Hmm. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that hasn't been done before and done at scale. It has kind of been, but it's insanely yeah. expensive. This L4S technology is essentially the mobile network saying, yeah, cities we want to work with you more knowing that connected cities are important and there's safety critical data streams and this would be one of them so one sim nine thousand kilometers we tele drove for four days at mobile world congress and didn't lose contact and interestingly for the nerds out there our total round trip was at most about 130 milliseconds you can get to about 200 milliseconds without losing yeah. out the engineers will probably shout at me for that but <laughs> you can't it's 200 milliseconds without losing contact with a car. You can still drive the car. Got it. And well, here's one for you based off my, you know, any Uber driver will know, you know, anytime you're downtown with really tall buildings, the GPS gets all screwed up because yeah, I don't know, it's bouncing off building. I don't know why, but it always happens. Would that affect your car? Yeah. So, well, we have a solution to this. What we do before we go into a city, we go and network map that city. Mm -hmm. So, and you can buy these maps, but we essentially go and, and network map all of the main arteries that we're going to be traversing with our Got vehicles it. or tele-driving our vehicles. And so we know where the dead spots are and we just simply don't drive down there. Mm. Then what we also do in real time, our cars are updating this network map as well. This is really important. So we have a 3D map of the network throughput through the urban areas we'll be driving. And so, and then also, I mean, there's many spin-offs there, like, there's a great way for us to do partnerships with telcos on that to try and yeah. boost that signal. It's via, via vehicle to vehicle network stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's I'm going a bit on a tangent here, but there's yeah. a ton of opportunity to help, you know, essentially as cars be little mini masks closing out mini high sites for those mobile yeah. operators. 
closing out some of those dead spots, but that's in the future. Yeah, no, that, that I think there's a lot of cool technolog technological opportunities and synergies and components that, you know, will be appealing to cities and telecom and, you know, just everyone. It sounds like a yeah. big kind of benefit for you guys here with Vey is that there's this confined geography, right? That you've got limits, you know, that it's like, hey, downtown, we're not going to go an hour out of town, but it's like, you know, so now you can map a certain yeah. area to avoid cell de cellular dead spots and to avoid, you know, having, you know, some of these longer tail issues that might come up. I guess one thing that, you know, Uber, and I think a lot of new mobility companies have sort of pitched and offered, and now cities are becoming very wary is the additional congestion, right? Like, you know, how do you sort of feel like, I guess to me, like, I don't really see this as taking cars off the road, but I don't know. I'm curious, like, how do you think about the kind of negative externalities to a city? Like, you know, you're yeah. working with cities. How are you going to get that, convince them to give you those parking spots, for example? Yeah, it's a great question, right? And I think at the initial stages, this is, it's hard to get your head around. And the reality is you only displace vehicles and you only make the vehicle transportation more efficient at scale. Now, the question yeah. is, what kind of scale do you need? We, you know, in our models, we think this is a few hundred cars. You start mm -hmm. displacing vehicle ownership, yeah, in time. Yeah. So as little as that. But obviously, if this thing uh, finds product market fit and we're doing 10, 20, 30 cities and we're doing a few thousand cars at each city, people will decide to take this service versus uh, using a car. Mm -hmm. Now, so if you start unpacking those numbers, you will displace the inefficiencies of cars. Now, remember, the inefficiencies of cars are also cars being used by one person and taken across the city and used in a parking lot and put in a parking lot for the whole day. Yeah. A parking lot, that space there is inefficiency and obviously concrete jungles or parking lots you want to disavow over time. So, you know, there is the kind of carbon footprint of the vehicle moving, but then there's also the vehicle footprint. I need a parking at home and then I need a parking at work and then I need a yeah. parking at the shops. In theory, we, you know, well, at scale, our cars would be in motion most of the time. Yeah. So I definitely, you know, obviously you did position it as 20 to 40% cheaper than ride hail, right? So it's like, if you're taking this instead of an Uber, I think that's a bit of a wash, but I do think the other kind of more compelling, you know, if I'm th thinking about from a city point of view, it's like, oh, I've been kind of burned by Uber before. I, I think they kind of screwed up with scooters and micro mobility. I think they like regulated it way too hard when it had a yeah. lot of potential uh, benefits uh, to congestion. And now, okay, here comes this new mode. I do think taking this instead of your own car, right? Because you get rid of the parking, you know, obviously curb space is a huge issue right now. And then also getting people to ditch their own cars, right? I do think that at this price point, because it's cheaper than Uber and Lyft, like right now, it's very limited where you could maybe ditch a car and take, you know, rely solely on Uber and Lyft and public transit. But it's like, yeah. hey, this is one option that really, you know, it's like basically as good as a car or ride hail, but cheaper. And so it really, you know, if there was some way to kind of build that, you know, like I saw a program in Santa Monica recently, it was, you know, kind of, you know, ditch your car and you get $200 in public transportation credit for the summer, you know, stuff like that. I think that would probably be, you know, the most compelling to cities. Yeah, exactly. It's going to take a bit of scale to really, you know, work out exactly mm -hmm. how to, how we're going to reduce the carbon footprint and the, this land footprint. But if it finds product market fit, the numbers speak for themselves, right? Yeah. You, you can imagine this thing. I think also, you know, we work with cities, wherever we go, you know, and it makes sense. And it's tried to say, but we really do. The whole Hamburg permitting in Germany mm -hmm. was done with the city and trying to ad address a, a, a geo or geography that had less public transport. And so yeah. the thinking was, if we put this there, is that a bridge for public transport? Like super interesting thinking. We're hand in glove with the Hamburg senator there. So it's very much our approach to to work with the cities and go at their pace as well. You know, yeah. we're not going to just dump thousands of cars on the pavement and expect people to use it and the taxpayers sure. to pay for the upkeep and, you know, keeping the streets clean. So, yeah, that's been our approach. Very cool. Very cool. Well, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is what it's like to be a teledriver, because obviously, you know, pretty well known for covering the rideshare industry and what it's like to be an Uber and Lyft driver. But I'm curious. Um, okay. So you guys are going to be launching in Las Vegas at some point. Where will your teledrivers be located? What are you looking for? And what's it like to, you know, teledrive? 
Yeah. So look, our tele drivers are going to be in city. I think, you know, once there's 6G and 7G and, you know, different compression technologies of radio frequency, maybe there's a world in which so in Vegas tele drivers. Start. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So we're building out our, our tele stations in Vegas. We have our cars in a garage. Cool. So, so and and the way it works for our tele driving. So we have a tele driving academy, and there's safety standards, there's safety levels that you t- take to get there. Being a tele driver, from what we hear, is a great experience. What we try and do too is not only. I mean, we're very selective in who we hire at the beginning mm-hmm. part of this business for a whole bunch of reasons. But then we also spend a lot of time training our tele drivers, and and we have a career path for our tele drivers also into our technology department, yeah. right? So yeah. there's a way to become, you know, a tele driver, tele operator, a technician, and potentially go into the garage and the mech en- uh, mechanical engineering around the car, and then even further. Yeah. So it is our aim to do to have that career trajectory, and so we think it's it's a pretty good job. Yeah. There's a ton of technology in it. It's pretty cool. You get to try out new tech that's shaping the safety of driving mm-hmm. and not just for tele driving. There's a whole bunch of tech that right. we've got in there, safety tech. And so it exposes you to a technology world as well. And the reality is for a very long time, we are going to need human drivers in the loop. Yeah. So we feel pretty strongly about building out this part of our business. Where have you found most of your teledrivers so far for these beta tests? I'm kind of curious if this, you know, if I'm an, you know, obviously a lot of people get attracted to Uber and Lyft and, you know, that name, and then they get in, they start doing it. Some love it, some hate it, and some, you know, move on to other things. And I'm curious if this is one of those adjacencies, right? Because on the, you know, I guess the, one of the downsides, right, is you don't have that customer interaction, which can be good and bad, <laughs> right? But then also, you know, like driver safety is a big issue right now, right? Like there's all these videos of drivers being attacked and you're picking up people who you don't know late at night, like, you know, tele-driving, I see, hey, if you're someone who's worried about that safety or the miles you're putting on your car, I'm just curious, you know, how much of a path you're seeing from Uber and Lyft drivers to come be tele-drivers, or is it just, you know, young kids who've been playing video games all their life, you know, now they want to go do some tele-driving? No, it's not young kids yet. I mean, what <laughs> maybe not young is, kids, uh, mature uh, uh, young adults. No, but but it's not the gamers at all. It's career drivers, hmm. and they're coming they have to you. you. Yeah, they and they have a unique set of skills. They're, they're obviously your ability to stay focused and keep your mm. attention. So I'd probably be a bad tele driver, but, but <laughs> to keep your focused attention for a long time is a key skill. And so we test for that. You know, demeanor, decorum, like how you present yourself, how how you act yeah. is, is all very important as well. But it's a skill driver. Mm. I imagine in, in in a decade's time there might be a bunch of these technologies that account for that. Yeah. But we really do respect the human in the loop on this. We think it's an incredibly powerful safety feature. And so if we can bring some scale to that, add some so- safety software to that, clever yeah. safety software, that's kind of the the sweet spot for us. Yeah, no, I like that. I'm sort of just trying to think, you know, I always like highlighting these sort of what I call adjacent jobs, career paths. Some people get tired of, you know, the more traditional gig economy, or some people want to graduate. Some people are tired of putting, you know, miles on their own car. So they go drive for an employee service, you know, employee ride hail, right? So I do think that's kind of one of the the cool paths. And it sounds like the skilled driver component, right? That ability, like a truck driver who can focus on, you know, a long <laughs> straightaway road for hours at a time and not look at their phone, you know, you know, so kind of highlighting like the qualities that would lead to success for this driving. It's also worth saying too that these tele drivers build their own community too. So yeah. I mean, you know, I guess it's the obligatory startup thing, but we have we have our own table tennis and you know, we have this little gymnasium and stuff. Yeah. And you'll find that tele drivers, you know, they have their own mm. kind of cultural subset and they understand yeah. each other. And there's this bond and they help each other out to obviously you can take comfort breaks, this training. You know, we think there is a good stack for our tele drivers there. And like, I'm always amazed at how these guys operate these vehicles. Yeah, it's no, that, that is a good point, right? Because one of the things that can, you know, is kind of a downside. It's a bit lonely out there, right? When you're driving a truck, an Uber, you know, an impl- whatever it is, right? You're out there by yourself and you might be chatting with people on WhatsApp or little walkie talkie groups, but that is kind of cool. If you have that ability to, you know, you're all teledriving in the same place, you have a little more of a community. So awesome. Right. Justin, I really appreciate you uh, coming on. Is there anything else uh, you want to hit on before we go here? 
No, I just think it's an incredibly exciting space. You know, I think yeah. there's this kind of convergence between autonomy. I think teledriving is a key piece of autonomy. I think it's a nice on-ramp to get auton the autonomy business model done. And then there's a whole bunch of other value vectors around teledriving that are super interesting on logistics and ports and airports yeah. and stuff like that too, which is probably another pod in a little while. But a tremendous amount of opportunity. We see this as a way to safely drive people at scale and provide a, a pretty good career path for mm -hmm. drivers into the world of technology coupled tightly you know with this autonomy future and so yeah. i think it's pretty yeah. cool we're super excited about it and i really appreciate you having having us on having me on today it's so much well, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes and who knows maybe we'll be able to get me behind the wheel of a teledriving apparatus someday so <laughs> next time you're in vegas next time we'll next very time shortly we'll, 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 we'll see how i do awesome well if well, folks mate, want to follow we'll, we'll, we'll take you we'll take you for a demo <laughs> absolutely Nice. If folks want to follow Vey or follow you, where should they go? Yeah, our website is vey.io. You know, you can hit me up, justin.spratt at vey.io. Right, um, cool. I'm on Twitter, Justin Spratt, and we're on LinkedIn as well. But cool. if you ping me, I will respond. And happy to be challenged. I, you know, we love the debate. We love making this space better too. So, yeah. so bring it on. Right on, Justin. Thank you.